Out of the Storm by William Hope Hodgson Hush, said my friend the scientist, as I walked into his laboratory. I had opened my lips to speak, but stood silent for a few minutes at his request. He was sitting at his instrument, and the thing was tapping out a message in a curiously irregular fashion, stopping a few seconds, then going on at a furious pace. It was during a somewhat longer than usual pause that, growing slightly impatient, I ventured to address him. Anything important? I asked. For God's sake, shut up, he answered back in a high, strained voice. I stared. I am used to pretty abrupt treatment from him at times when he is much engrossed in some particular experiment, but this was going a little too far, and I said so. He was writing, and for reply, he pushed several loosely written sheets over to me with one curt word. Read. With a sense half of anger, half of curiosity, I picked up the first and glanced at it. After a few lines, I was gripped and held securely by a morbid interest. I was reading a message from one in the last extremity. I will give it word for word. John, we are sinking. I wonder if you really understand what I feel at the present time. You sitting comfortably in your laboratory, I, out here upon the waves, already one among the dead. Yes, we are doomed. There is no such thing as help in our case. We are sinking steadily, remorselessly. God, I must keep up and be a man. I need not tell you that I am in the operator's room. All the rest are on deck, or dead, in the hungry thing which is smashing the ship to pieces. I do not know where we are, and there is no one of whom I can ask. The last of the officers was drowned nearly an hour ago, and the vessel is now little more than a sort of breakwater for the giant seas. Once, about an hour ago, I went out onto the deck. My God, the sight was terrible. It is a little after midday, but the sky is the color of mud. Do you understand? Gray mud. Down from it there hang vast lappets of clouds, not such clouds as I have ever seen before, but monstrous, mildewed-looking hulls. They show solid, save where the frightful wind tears their lower edges into great feelers that swirl savagely above us, like the tentacles of some enormous horror. Such a sight is difficult to describe to the living, though the dead of the sea know of it without words of mine. It is such a sight that none is allowed to see and to live. It is a picture for the doomed and the dead, one of the sea's hell orgies, one of the thing's monstrous gloatings over the living, say, the alive in death, those upon the brink. I have no right to tell you of it. To speak of it to one of the living is to initiate innocence into one of the infernal mysteries. To talk of foul things to a child, yet I care not. I will expose, in all its hideous nakedness, the death side of the sea. The undoomed living shall know some of the things that death has hitherto so well guarded. Death knows not of this little instrument beneath my hands that connects me still with the quick, else would he haste to quiet me. Hark you, John, I have learned undreamt of things in this little time of waiting. I know now why we are afraid of the dark. I have never imagined such secrets of the sea and of the grave, which are one and the same. Listen. Ah, but I was forgetting you cannot hear. I can. The sea is... Hush. The sea is laughing, as though hell cackled from the mouth of an ass. It is jeering. I can hear its voice echo like satanic thunder amid the mud overhead. It is calling to me. Call. I must go. The sea calls. O oh God, art thou indeed God? Canst thou sit above and watch calmly that which I have just seen? Nay, thou art no God. Thou art weak, 
and puny beside this foul thing which thou didst create in thy lusty youth. It is now God, and I am one of its children. Are you there, John? Why don't you answer? Listen, I ignore God, for there is a stronger than he. My God is here, beside me, around me, and will be soon above me. You know what that means. It is merciless. The sea is now all the God there is. That is one of the things I have learnt. Listen, it is laughing again. God is it, not he. It called, and I went out onto the decks. All was terrible. It is in the waste, everywhere. It has swamped the ship. Only the forecastle, bridge, and poop stick up, out from the bestial, reeking thing, like three islands in the midst of shrieking foam. At times the gigantic billows assail the ship from both sides. They form, momentarily, arches above the vessel, arches of dull, curved water, half a hundred feet towards the hideous sky. Then they descend, roaring. Think of it, you cannot. There is an infection of sin in the air. It is the exhalations from the thing. Those left upon the drenched islets of shattered wood and iron are doing the most horrible things. The thing is teaching them. Later, I felt the vial informing of its breath, but I have fled back here to pray for death. On the forecastle, I saw a mother and her little son clinging to an iron rail, a great billow heaved up above them, descending in a falling mountain of brine. It passed and they were still there. The thing was only toying with them, yet all the same, it had torn the hands of the child from the rail and the child was clinging frantically to its mother's arm. I saw another vast hill hurl up to port and hover above them. Then the mother stooped, and bit like a foul beast at the hands of her wee son. She was afraid that his little additional weight would be more than she could hold. I heard his scream even where I stood. It drove to me upon that wild laughter. It told me again that God is not he, but it. Then the hill thundered down upon those two. It seemed to me that the thing gave a bellow, as it leapt. It roared above them, churning and growling, then surged away, and there was only one, the mother. There appeared to me to be blood, as well as water upon her face, especially about her mouth. But the distance was too great, and I cannot be sure. I looked away. Close to me, I saw something further, a beautiful young girl, her soul hideous, with the breath of the thing, struggling with her sweetheart for the shelter of the chart house side. He threw her off, but she came back at him. I saw her hand come from her head, where still clung the wreckage of some form of headgear. She struck at him, he shouted, and fell away to leeward, and she smiled, showing her teeth. So much for that, I turned elsewhere. Out! Upon the thing, I saw gleams, horrid and suggestive, below, in the crests of the waves. I have never seen them until this time. I saw a rough sailor man washed away from the vessel. One of the huge breakers snapped at him. Those things were teeth. It has teeth. I heard them clash. I heard his yell. It was no more than a mosquito's shrilling amid all that laughter, but it was very terrible. There is worse than death. The ship is lurching very queerly with a sort of sickening heave. I fancy I've been asleep. No, I remember now. I hit my head when she rolled so strangely. My leg is doubled under me. I think it is broken, but it does not matter. I have been praying. I... I... What was it? I feel calmer. 
more resigned now. I think I've been mad. What was it that I was saying? I cannot remember. It was something about, about God. I, I believe I blasphemed. May he forgive me. Thou knowest, God, that I was not in my right mind. Thou knowest that I am very weak. Be with me in the coming time. I have sinned, but thou art all merciful. Are you there, John? It is very near the end now. I had so much to say, but it all slips away from me. What was it that I said? I take it all back. I was mad and, and God knows, he is merciful and I have very little pain now. I feel a bit drowsy. I wonder whether you are there, John. Perhaps, after all, no one has heard the things I've said. It is better so. The living are not meant. And yet, I do not know. If you are there, John, you will. You will tell her how it was. But not, not, hark. There was such a thunder of water overhead just then. I fancy two vast seas have met in mid-air across the top of the bridge and burst all over the vessel. It must be soon now. And there was such a number of things I had to say. I can hear voices in the wind. They are singing. It is like an enormous dirge. I think I've been dozing again. I pray God humbly that it will be soon. You will not, not tell her anything about, about what I may have said, will you, John? I mean those things which I ought not to have said. What was it I did say? My head is growing strangely confused. I wonder whether you really do hear me. I may be talking only to that vast roar outside. Still, it is some comfort to go on and I will not believe that you do not hear all I say. Hark again, a mountain of brine must have swept clean over the vessel. She has gone right over onto her side. She is back again. It will be very soon now. Are you there, John? Are you there? It is coming. The sea has come for me. It is rushing down through the companionway. It... It is like a vast jet. My God, I am drowning. I am drown. Hello, everyone. The story we just heard was Out of the Storm by William Hope Hodgson. It was first published in 1909. So I first read this story in a paperback collection of Hodgson's work. It's called The Weird Tales of William Hope Hodgson. Uh, This was a paperback that was put out by the British Library in their series called Tales of the Weird, and this one was edited by Xavier Aldana Reyes. So this tale I found to be really quite interesting and very evocative and emotive for William Hope Hodgson. To understand what Hodgson is doing in this story, I think we need to talk a little bit about Hodgson's life. So in the introduction to this paperback, there is a quote about Hodgson that I found was particularly relevant to this story. The quote is from H.P. Lovecraft, who was an admirer of William Hope Hodgson and his work. H.P. Lovecraft said that his fiction contained vast occasional power in its suggestion of lurking worlds and beings behind the ordinary surface of life. So that quote is quite relevant to this story, because in this story we have the sea being personified as a force that is sentient. Hodgson himself was a sailor for many years, and a lot of Hodgson's fiction is set on the sea. Hodgson's relationship with the sea seem to start out as a bit of an idealistic love sort of relationship and then soured into disillusionment and eventually a bitterness towards the sea. Hodgson ran away from school as a child because he wanted to become a sailor 
This was when he was about 13 or 14, I think. Eventually, he apprenticed as a cabin boy and then later um, trained as a sailor and would be a sailor for many years. However, his experiences at sea were not very good. And after he left that career, he refused to ever go to sea again. In lots of Hodgson's nautical stories, they're about monsters uh, that come out of the sea and are horrific in that way. But in this story, the sea itself is the monster. And in particular, Hodgson is comparing the sea with God. In one of the phrases, the unnamed uh, character in the story who is communicating with our viewpoint character, uh, he says this, Nay, thou art no god, thou art weak and puny beside this foul thing which thou didst create in thy lusty youth. It is now god, and I am one of its children. So a pretty powerful statement. Basically, he's saying that the sea has supplanted god uh, in this character's view. This makes a lot of sense because when you're at sea, particularly at this time, you are at the whim so to speak, of this vast environment around you where there are storms, tsunamis, hurricanes, all kinds of things which can be incredibly dangerous. And this isn't even including some of the other perils that existed, things like running low on supplies or naval battles. The sea is particularly scary in this respect because if something goes wrong, if you're wrecked in a storm, you are almost completely helpless and doomed to a horrible fate. In the story, it sounds like uh, the sea is laughing at times. He also talks about the waves, there being shapes in the waves that he had never seen before. The narrator says, I saw gleams, horrid and suggestive, below the crests of the waves. I've never seen them until this time. One of the huge breakers snapped at him, Those things were teeth. It has teeth. I heard them clash. Not only this, but the sea itself seems to have an influence on the humans around him. Whether this is actually true or this is just the narrator's interpretation of events is not entirely clear, but he describes people who are on the deck of the ship and are so terrified that they're throwing each other off or people are clinging to each other and then other people are throwing them off because they're afraid that these other people will drag them down. So this is really a a horrific scene. And the structure of the story is that this is all being communicated through some sort of a device, whether that's like a telegraph or like Morse code or something else. It's implied that the scientist who we meet at the start of the story, the friend of the actual narrator of the story, um, has developed some sort of a device that can communicate over long distances. And because of this, he's able to, to communicate with people in the midst of a storm. And normally, this is not something that would be possible. So this is an experience which is normally something that no one would live through, but is now able to be communicated Uh, to somebody else who's not in the midst of it. The person who is communicating with our narrator describes how it was a mistake to tell or to communicate these things because once somebody is initiated, their innocence is destroyed. They understand the true nature of things. There's some kind of forbidden knowledge about the nature of the sea that is being communicated to the outside world. This is drawing perhaps on Hodgson's own experience when we consider, like I said, he started out with what seems to be a fairly idealistic view of life at sea and then later realized that it was actually pretty horrible and then refused to ever go back, I think quite understandably. Out of the Storm is not the only story that Hodgson wrote uh, where he describes a weird side to the sea. In many of Hodgson's stories, there is a ship that goes astray into strange waters, whether that be more naturally occurring uh, phenomenon. So, um, for instance, uh, there is a story, The Boats of the Glen Carrick, where a ship is wrecked and the people evacuate onto smaller boats 
And then they get stuck in this massive sea of weeds that goes on until the horizon and they almost can't escape from it. Uh, So that's a natural phenomenon that seems to exist. It's not supernatural. But there are other stories from Hodgson where a ship does encounter a sort of supernatural area in the sea. In Hodgson's novel, The Ghost Pirates, it's about a ship that sort of accidentally sails between dimensions almost and encounters um, a ghost ship uh, that sort of overlaps with their ship. It's a pretty terrifying novel, and I highly recommend reading it if you haven't already. But you can see Hodgson draws on the weirdness and the terror of the sea, whether that be natural or supernatural. I think in this story, those two worlds meet. We see the supernatural aspect. Oh, well, actually, okay. First, we see the natural aspect of the sea that is terrifying. That is to say, storms that can wreck a ship. But then we also see this supernatural side to the sea as well. We see uh, that the sea has some sort of a malevolent entity or consciousness behind it. Remember that quote uh, from H.P. Lovecraft where he talks about how Hodgson evokes the lurking... um, Let me read it again. So H.P. Lovecraft says that uh, Hodgson evokes the suggestion of lurking worlds and beings behind the ordinary surface of life. So that's exactly what this story is about. There is the suggestion of some sort of a malevolent entity behind the natural phenomenon of the sea, or the natural phenomena like storms that exist in the sea. That is not just, uh, you know, a storm is not just changes in air pressure or changes in water temperature and so on. It's actually some sort of a entity or consciousness that toys with ships on the sea, like it's a game. For me, this story seems like a bit of a cathartic experience for Hodgson. He's getting out all of his feelings about the sea, in a way how much he hates it, but also expressing the kind of horror that exists when one is at sea and is at completely at the mercy of this unknowing, unreasoning force that is so much greater than a human is. And Hodgson also comments on what being confronted with that force does to people. It terrifies people. Um, there's, a, there's the suggestion that it actually makes people sort of evil or makes people kind of delight in hurting each other. When he talks about the people who are throwing other people off the ship, he describes uh, a mother who bites her child and the child falls overboard. And then he says in a flash of lightning, I think, that she seems to be smiling. So that's a terrifying image to see a mother do something like that. This exact sort of passage actually reminded me of um, something I had heard in my own life when I was younger. Somebody described to me being in a car accident, or rather a bus accident. They were in a passenger bus, and it collided with another vehicle, or something happened. And uh, people panicked and immediately started crawling over the seats and over one another trying to get to the exit, which is quite, in a way, quite understandable in an emergency when somebody is afraid for their life. They're instinct to survive takes over and they do whatever they have to do to try and get to safety. And I wouldn't be surprised if Hodgson saw things like that um, when he was at sea that inspired this aspect of the story. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this story. This was really um, quite a good story, I thought, although it is quite short and it's a little bit clunky in the framing of the story. We sort of get the start, the front frame, but not the back frame. The story just kind of ends. But overall, I liked it. I like what Hodgson was suggesting. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this story, and I hope you have a good day. Bye for now. If you've enjoyed this content, consider supporting the Eldritch Archives to grow and make more content. Become a supporter on Patreon, buy an audiobook on Bandcamp, or like, comment on, or share one of the videos on YouTube. And as always, thank you for listening.